Sibile, will you call the matter for the record, please? All right. I don't know where he's disappeared to, but we're dealing with leaving hands. I'm um, leaving to appearance, appearing before, before Judge window. Leaving hands, P2I Limited, and others against all mutual unit class managers and others. His number is 42728 of 2010. Thank you. Thank you, my lady. My lady, uh, together with my little friends, Mr. Fagan and Mr. Mbukiria, uh, I appear for the applicant in the application for leave to appeal uh, the defendant in the main action. Lady, I appear for the respondents together with um, advocate Investor, advocate uh, Anele and Gibby. So the appearances are yes. just before. Yes, my lady. Mr. Pam, then over to you. I, I I want to say maybe let's deal with housekeeping. I have on record that we tried to set down this application for leave to appeal on at least three occasions, and for some reason we were not succeeding because of availability of counsel. Do I do I have that correct? Uh, my lady, I do know. What I can say to you is that uh, certainly I was asked about availability. I think on one occasion I wasn't available. Uh, I might be wrong. But what I, where your ladyship is correct to my recollection is that there were a number of attempts. I can't say how many. There were a number of attempts between your ladyship, between the parties, uh, to have the matter set down. Uh, to the extent that the question is directed at the length of time it's taken before we finally dealt with the application for leave to appeal. Uh, certainly, uh, there's nothing that comes from the court system. It, it, it just seemed like a strange set of events. Your ladyship was at the SCA, uh, the time of the year and the like. But, but there is no doubt that uh, uh, attempts were made to deal with this matter as soon as uh, one could. I had to raise it because, I mean, six months Given the importance of the matter, is um, you know raises eyebrows, yeah. and 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 I had to you know raise it with both parties that it's not for lack of trying. Uh, um, my leadership, uh, can I just say this? Uh, whilst I can't uh, say anything in relation to the detail, uh, the one thing I'm aware of is that there were certainly attempts made uh, throughout to have the matter set down. Right. Thank you. Then uh, I obviously have carefully looked at the um, <laughs> at the list of grounds, right? And in order for us to have a productive morning, because I've got a commitment on a conference in another matter at eleven, I think that um, I would ask you to please, and Kate, my estimation is that there are at least four main grounds for complaint from the shopping list of grounds, right? And um, I would like you to take about five, 15 minutes to address me on what your issues are, and we can then engage and then hear from Mr. Epstein. Thanks. My lady, can I, with that invitation from your ladyship, go to what I would suggest is the crux of the issue? Mm -hmm. uh, both in relation to the question of the element of wrongfulness, in other words, the legal duty of care, as in the context of uh, pure economic loss based on an omission, as well as the question of causation, both legal and factual causation. Your leadership will be aware that when you dealt with the question of the legal duty of care, you recognized the contractual issues and the contractual duties. You recognize the statutory aspects and the statutory duties. You found that one had to do so, make, make the finding you did indirectly in the and what you described as in this specific milieu attendant upon this matter. Now, can I unpack that milieu to illustrate why at every level the, the case does raise novel issues? And I'm going to state up front that in two things. That firstly, in the context of the duty that your ladyship found, both having regard to the contractual relationships as well as the statutory issues. In other words, what your, your ladyship described as the milieu. Uh, you won't find anything in previous judgments and nobody could refer to that. 
The second, in the context of an area of the law where our courts express caution, what your leadership will find is that typically where the ambit of the duty of care is widened, as was the case admittedly in this case, that goes to the FCA. In other words, you'll typically find that the widening of a particular area uh, in the law of dealing relating to wrongfulness in pure economic loss, that's a matter that interests the FCA, and that's where the law substantially has been developed. Now, let's look at the questions in the particular case. Matters which are not uh, contested. There was a relationship between the ultimate beneficiaries and the trust. In other words, without mixing concepts, it is in the trust that they entrusted their responsibility through a trust deed. The trust itself uh, had living hands, the first plaintiff, as its corporate trustee. It concluded a separate agreement with uh, uh, Omut. So what do you have? You have a relationship between the beneficiaries and the trustees. The trustees acting for the benefit of the beneficiaries with the fiduciary responsibility to the trustees. And an important aspect, my lady, an aspect that wasn't dealt with in the, in the judgment, but we say is quite important, is, and I'm just going to give you the reference, your leadership can look at it, at page 71 of the pleadings in the trust deed. You'll see that the protection the beneficiaries sought, and remember, ultimately what your leadership found is, is because of the beneficiaries that the duty of care was on, that the beneficiaries secured for themselves through the trust deed a obligation less onerous than the one that you've placed on Omut. In other words, they could only chase after the trustees if there was dishonesty, willful misconduct, or gross negligence, none of which was found to be the case in the present instance. So as a starting point, my lady, in the context of two separate relationships, both contractual, your ladyship found a delictual duty of care. In circumstances where the duty of care your ladyship imposed on Omud was with respect, my lady, undefined. It was a duty in, in, in a general sense, but it was a duty which exceeded the rights which the beneficiaries had against their own trustees in terms of the trustee. So that's, that's the first point. The second point, my ladyship, is that our courts have generally been reluctant to extend the duty of care where there are such contractual relationships in place. Now, normally what they've done is if there's a contractual relationship between A and B, uh, they said A can't sue B in dealing uh, through uh, uh, the duty of care because they define their relationship. What your leadership in this instance did is looked at two contractual relationships, said nonetheless, the one party had a, a duty of care towards the other party, cutting out the middle party. In other words, the party they bound them, even though they were bound. Now, we say that that certainly, for purposes of determining a duty of care and the extension of the duty of care, warrants the attention of the SCA, uh, both because it may come to a different conclusion and because it's, it, it, it's a compelling enough reason. Uh, for, so so both, both elements of Section 17.1 uh, come into play. Uh, the, the third issue, my lady, is that your ladyship found, correctly so, because the facts, on the facts it was undisputed. Your ladyship found that the theft was committed by the first plaintiff, its trustees. Now, that is a substantial issue, and the, a question which warrants and, uh, the attention of the court, because that other court may come to a different conclusion, and it is certainly a compelling reason to do so, is in circumstances where the very parties entrusted by the beneficiaries as the repository of their trust stole the money. Should a third party who had a contractual relationship to act in a particular way pay for that? The third point, my lady, is can there be any suggestion of wrongfulness, let alone causation, if Omut acted as it was required to act, admittedly. So remember, so your ladyship starts with the fact that it was given an instruction it, in terms of the Trust Property Control Act, uh, it had to act on that. 
what your ladyship said in the broader milieu, uh, there were wider considerations. The question is whether that uh, is correct in law. And we say that ultimately in this dif difficult field of the law, another court may take a different view. Remember, your ladyship, in a sense, made a judgment call. And with judgment calls, there's always the, uh, there's always the prospect of somebody else coming to a different conclusion. And that judgment call uh, is what, what drives the finding on the legal duty of care. In relation to the element of causation, on your ladyship's finding and the admitted fact that the theft was undertaken by the trustees entrusted uh, with the safeguarding of that, whether that was a novus causes uh, intervenience, at least for purposes of legal causation. In other words, whether that was the legal cause of the theft having been suffered. Now, your ladyship found that what Omut ought to have done is to have reported the request for the transfer. Let's just pause there for the time being. You heard the evidence of Ms. Atchison. She was one of the sellers to the financial group, as was Mr. Uh, Cover, as was Investing. And she testified that there was nothing that came up on the radar for suspicion. Second thing is you heard the evidence of Mr. Anderson. FAM was duly licensed to undertake management of the portfolio. Third thing is, you know, when you talk of the chicken and egg situation, I don't say it lightly. At the time that the money was transferred, there is absolutely no evidence that there was any reason to doubt the integrity of the people to, uh, uh, who were in charge of Fidentia and FAM. So what would the investigation have revealed? Going beyond speculation of what might have happened, the investigation would have revealed that there was a legitimate sale of, of business agreement. The investigation would have revealed that FAM was duly licensed and that it was entitled to do what it did in law. The investigation would have revealed that in terms of the contract with Omut, Omut had to act on the instructions of the trustees and that the instruction to transfer the money was uh, properly authorized and that Omut sought that proper authorization. And of course, your ladyship came to different findings or conclusions in relation to that set of facts. But again, once you've got a certain set of facts, the question you've, asked, you've got to ask yourself is, is there a reasonable prospect of another court coming to a different conclusion? And in any event, is there a compelling reason in circumstances where on the face of it, as your ladyship found, Omut acted in accordance with the legal provisions, there was a wider milieu which required it to do something different. In relation to the question of uh, the uh, third party claim and the first plaintiff, your ladyship said that the first plaintiff was not a party. And of course, we say a different court will come to a different conclusion, reasonably so, because you join a third party who's not a party to the proceedings. This was a delictual claim. This wasn't a contractual claim. The first plaintiff, which was admittedly responsible for the theft, was a party to the proceedings as well. There was nothing in law, we say, and certainly we think another court may come to a different conclusion to that arrived, uh, arrived by your ladyship. To join them as a third party, there was nothing in law preventing the uh, Omud from seeking a contribution in circumstances where the very party which was claiming against Omud was the party which was responsible for the theft. So we, we, we say, my ladyship, that when your ladyship refers in your judgment to the milieu, although that is said in the context of the duty, there is a milieu of issues in this case, all of which are challenging issues. Uh, your, your ladyship will know, your ladyship wrote the judgment, your ladyship engaged in the cause of argument. And in respect of each of those challenging uh, answers, it requires a widening of duty of care, your ladyship had to interpret provisions of uh, uh, statutes. And in the interpretation, your ladyship said that there's nothing direct. You've got to go indirectly. All of that are typically cases in respect of which you would want certainty going to another court, not for the sake of certainty, not simply to send it to another court to say, yes, this is a court case, because there's a reasonable uh, prospect that in relation to those interpretational issues, another court may come to a different conclusion. And in relation to the judgment calls your ladyship made, 
in finding that there was a duty of care in the milieu of circumstances. Another court may make a different judgment call. In relation to the third party issue, another court may well find that because the contribution is sought from a party which is already a party, and which admittedly on the facts before the court was responsible for a theft. There was no need to go the extra step of citing that party as a third party, that uh, in pleading to the case, the defendant Omut was entitled to seek the apportionment as it did seek. But really, for those reasons, we submit that there are at every level of the case. Another court may come to a different conclusion. We also submit that at every level of the case, Issues that your ladyship dealt with were sufficiently noble. You can't point to any judgments directly on point, so as to make it uh, uh, compelling, uh, uh, compelling reasons. And we consequently would ask that leave to appeal be granted. Uh, the, the Supreme Court of Appeal, we, we would submit to you is the right place for it to go to. And the order we would thus seek is that leave to appeal be granted to the Supreme Court of Appeal. The cost of this application be costing the appeal. So, um, can I just clarify a couple of, can you hear me well? Pardon? Can you hear me? I can hear you well enough. Thank you, my lady. Oh, thank you. Can I just clarify a couple of questions I have with the submissions that you, you have made? Yes, my lady. Let's start backwards on the apportionment issue. Yes. And so, on what evidence could I have found that... Um, apportionment is due in this instance? On the evidence, on the common cause evidence before your ladyship, because the one thing that's not in dispute, in fact, your ladyship makes the finding. Your ladyship uh, already made the finding. That's in paragraph five of your ladyship's judgment. It appears later as well. That it was the trust, through the trust, at the hands of the trustees, the corporate trustees, living hands, and remember the fact that they changed their directors. I, I get that, but, but then in what proportion would such an apportionment uh, be? My leadership, that's always in your leadership's discretion. We would submit that as the party which directly was not just involved in the loss suffered by the beneficiaries through negligence, but through theft. It should carry the substantive amount uh, of a percentage. That's always in the discretion of the, uh, of the court. We would su suggest entirely because it's, uh, uh, you're entitled to do that. But if not entirely, it would have been in a substantial portion. Simply because it, having been given the responsibility to look after the funds, having been the party which chose Omut in the first instance, and then terminated its mandate so that it would go over to FEM, and then having engaged in the theft, should be the party that carries the cane for this substantially, if not entirely. Uh, and, and, and there's just an additional aspect, my lady, and this is the, 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 the oddity of the case. You had two witnesses, the young and Milan, both of whom were with the Living Hands Trust in their period. It was Metco prior to that. Both of them were involved in the correspondence in one way or the other. Both of whom were with Living Hands through the period when the theft was being conducted. And both of whom who said they couldn't detect anything. The simple point of the matter is the party that was entrusted by the beneficiaries to look after its interests was the party that committed the theft that finding your ladyship has made. Right. Um, I know that I may I may hold a different view on the on the evidence that was before me up about that. But the second part that I just wanted to to clarify with you, this is apart from the complaint about widening the scope of wrongfulness. Mm -hmm. And obviously premised on an interpretation of of the various legislation and so on. I'm curious about um, your, your framing of causation in this matter. Because as I have it, the claim was uh, premised on, on an omission, right? 
And that omission is based on the failure to report. Yeah, you see, my lady, and let, that... me, let me finish perhaps my question and 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 then you can you mm. can address me fully on that. Now, if I look at the facts again, the inextricably linked to that is what evidence or what led to deal with the fact that it had discharged its duty completely. And my difficulty with this is that we have here correspondence from Mr. Cronier indicating, clearly indicating that something is amiss. And then there's, a, there's this, what I refer to the judgment, there's a black box, because Old Mutual says nothing about, about what happened in between the letter of the 15th and then the release of the funds. Or what's not telling us what kind of due diligence it performed on FEM. Leave aside, I, I understand that the question of whether your contractual obligations weighed higher than your duty of care, which I import statutorily. Leave aside that debate. Here we have no evidence which tells us this is the due diligence. Any caring fund manager surely would have conducted a careful due diligence. And if it spins on the facts, there was suspicion that something is amiss already. Surely then, almost rather than arguing causation on Actus novus intervenus. Surely there is a risk already created on the facts in the environment, which heightens the Bermuda's duty. I know you want to go to this SA. I know you want, but this is how this this looms large for me, and I, I want you to tell me something more. About it. I'm going to give your leadership a laundry list of reasons, but can I start yes. off? The very framing of the question, which is exactly the way that the plaintiff, the respondent in this uh, matter, approached it, illustrates that in seeking to make a finding having regard to the milieu of evidence that was before you, in relation to this very issue, your ladyship ignored that milieu. Your ladyship's starting point was what was the omission? The omission was a failure to report. That's, what, that's not where the inquiry ends. Let's start off firstly with the following, the correspondence, and you refer to Mr. Cronier. I'm just going to very briefly. The first was in relation to the 150 million. The problem they had in relation to the 150 million was whether there was authority on behalf of uh, their client, the living hands. Once the authority issue had been resolved, and all of that evidence before you, so there's no black box, the evidence before you, once that authority issue had been resolved, then they acted in, on the basis of their contractual obligation. So that's the first point. The second point is your leadership raises the question of they ought, ought to have done a due diligence. Of course, the question is what due, due diligence? Due diligence in relation to authority? Well, the answer to that is they sought and were given the authority that they required. Due diligence in relation to the trustworthiness of the Fidentia Group, what would that have revealed? First of all, there was no basis for such a due diligence. There was no, no reason for them to uh, uh, doubt the integrity. Secondly, and most importantly, what you did have is you did, had the evidence of Atchison, who also spoke to the mindset of uh, Cover and of Investec, that they as sellers, and remember Atchison testified about how long she was there, how important this was to her. She knew who she was getting. They as sellers had nothing before them to doubt the integrity of the purchases. They were passing the ball on to them. Then you had the evidence of De Jong and Milan. Even more important, De Jong and Milan were in that company, in that group. And in fact, uh, De Jong was the person who was authorized, amongst others, to sign the letter. He was appointed as a trustee. They said that for the entire period that they were there, they had, they had a falling out with Brown. They, they, they couldn't work with him eventually. But they had no reason to doubt the integrity. They had no reason to believe that the theft would occur. So what your leadership is, uh, is raising is that 
Omut should have done something which none of the parties who were closer to the fire than Omut did. But it's not just Omut should have done something, but just on the facts that were before me. Mm. Omut doesn't tell us what. Uh, but what that, it has. And if I recall correctly, mm. that the so called verification of authority happens properly after the payments or part of the payments have been released. No, that's not correct. They only released payments after they got the authorization. And that was the testimony before you as well, my lady. And, and the question you ask is, Omar didn't tell you. Another court, and that's another important issue in respect of which the court may come to, another court may come to a different conclusion, that in circumstances where the evidence before you does not establish that duty, is the fact that there isn't any evidence from Omut material at all. And we say that on the evidence and the matters I've taken you through, uh, another court will find that in these circumstances, the evidence illustrates that uh, what, you, what you see from Omut and the omission you visit in Omut was a finding which wasn't justified by the evidence before you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bam. Well, unless there are further questions, those are our submissions. Mark, uh, I don't want to detain you unduly. Um, and, and I think uh, Mr. Epson is going to address me. I think for me, one of the important issues is the statutory arrangements, um, the obligations of the trust uh, to the beneficiaries, and the duty of Omot as manager. And um, I have a sense that that requires um, more attention than the, the court below would have given to the matter. We can obviously debate all the other things about conversion and wrongfulness and all of that. But let me hear from Mr. Uh, Mr. Epson. Thank you very much, my lady. Thank you, my lady. My lady, may I start off with <clears throat> two points? Um, of course, um, everybody who appears in application leave to appeal immediately refers to Montchevo and the new test and the raised bar, and everybody knows that. And with respect, of course, uh, Milady knows that too. But the test is not uh, often recognized. And I want to refer Milady to what was said in the case of um, S versus Kruger. It's 2014, Volume 1, SACR 647. In the SCA 2014 Volume 1, SACR 647 SCA, and that's a judgment by uh, Lewis Leach, Teron Pele, Petsy. And in the judgment at um, paragraph 2, reference is made to the test. And importantly, there's reference to State versus Smith and um, the court said what the test of reasonable prospects of success postulates is a dispassionate decision based on the facts of the law that a court of appeal could reasonably arrive at a conclusion different to that of the trial court. In order to succeed, therefore, the appellant must convince this court on proper grounds that he has prospects of success on appeal and that those prospects are not remote but have a realistic chance of succeeding. More is required to be established than that there is a mere possibility of success that the case is arguable on appeal or the case cannot be categorized as hopeless. There must, in other words, be a sound, rational basis for the conclusion that there are prospects of success on appeal. And then importantly, my lady, in paragraph three, the time of this court is valuable and should be used to hear appeals that are truly deserving of its attention. It is in the interest of the administration of justice that the test set out above should be scrupulously followed. <coughs> now, it doesn't matter whether we're dealing with a matter of um, 170,000 Rand or 1.7 million or what they say is a staggering amount of 1.7 billion. Everybody must be treated the same way, as the courts have reiterated recently. Now, insofar as compelling reasons are concerned, and this is my second point, um, if I just revert to the first point for the moment. When we see language, in the, um, on a couple of occasions, Mr. Bam refers to that another court may come to uh, another conclusion. That may be a slip of the tongue in the sense that we know 
that we have where another court would come to another conclusion. And in paragraph nine of their written submissions, they say a court of appeal may well find a consideration of the transcript. I may well find on a consideration of the transcript that there's no evidence to support the conclusion that Ahmed was negligent in any of the respects alleged. Now that kind that test does that doesn't pass the test set out uh, in in the case I've referred to. And turning to compelling reasons, as I well, said, it doesn't which, which which is I mean the, obviously there are two tests right under one a small Roman numeral and then there is obviously a uh, to Roman numeral, which is, isn't this a matter that, that really warrants um, attention by, um, there are compelling reasons why it should be led by a, 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 a different court? Well, Milady, my answer to that as follows. Firstly, I want to refer Milady to the decision in MEC for Health, Eastern Cape versus Melane, M-E-L-A-N-E. We can only find it reported in 2022 JDR 1642 ECM, full bench of Khusen and Benenge and Norman. And at paragraph 46, um, the following is stated um, in Son Songono versus Minister of Law and Order, Leach considered the impact of Rule 491. The learned judge considered similarly worded Rule 49.3, which required that the notice of appeal should state whether the whole or part of the judgment is appealed against, specify the findings of fact and or ruling of law appealed against, and the ground of appeal. Um, and then it goes on to say that... <clears throat> bear with me. Uh, it's repeated in Minister of Safety and Security versus Lutchman, L-U-T-C-H-M-A-N, 2022, J-D-R, 1074. And there again, there was reference to Songano. The important part is this, my lady. Court said, Leach, J, as he then was said, I'm not aware of any judgment dealing specifically with grounds of appeal as envisaged in Rule 49.1b. However, 49.3 is couched in similar terms and also requires the filing of a notice of appeal which shall specify the grounds on which the appeal is founded. In that regard, uh, in, in regard to that subrule, it is now well established that the provisions thereof are peremptory and that the grounds of appeal are required. Now, the lady will struggle to find in their application for leave to appeal reliance on the fact that there are compelling reasons. The lady won't struggle because struggle means you will struggle and then find it. You won't find it. It's not there. They did not rely on compelling grounds as the... Uh, uh, as, as a reason to be granted leave to appeal. And the lady, if you should find that they're allowed at this point to rely on compelling grounds, well, my lady, we say that there are no compelling grounds. My lady dealt with the law. My lady dealt with the cases of, of, of me, of trustees, um, um, of, of the, the aquarium case, um, of, of LaRue and Day. All those, the, the law was dealt with. What we are dealing with, my lady, are, are the facts. Now, my lady, can I turn to this? We, we, we hear reference to the milieu, the constant reference to milieu. And I understand milieu is a, a word that's used in regard to a, a person's social environment. But let me, let me accept that Mr. Bam is referring to the surrounding circumstances. Of course, all those surrounding facts are, are the facts which were placed before you. None of no facts were placed before you by... By Ahmed. But herein lies the problem, my lady. And my lady, I, 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 your, your, my lady's indicated the, the, the importance of the matter. And I've, I've been around long enough to, 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 to read the court, if I can put it that way. But I, I would like my lady the opportunity to really submit why you should not grant leave to appeal. And if you do, it should not be on every ground. The first is, my lady, that their whole application is completely flawed. It's flawed because of a misunderstanding and a mischaracterization of your of your judgment. Let me ask you, Malay, if you could look at the application for leave to appeal. And I will just show you, it won't take long, the constant theme that permeates this entire application 
and why it is completely fraught, because they rely for their leave to appeal on findings you did not make. Lady, if you look at the leave to appeal, the first one, paragraph one, they say the court erred in finding that any loss was suffered by the Living Hands Trust as a result of the liquidation of the investment portfolio and the payment of the funds in the first plaintiff's bank account. That's not what the lady found. The loss was caused because they did not report. That's what was not. Milady, paragraph 5, 5.1. Court erred in finding in effect that the defendant was not only legally entitled, but indeed legally obliged to breach its contractual obligations by not repaying the funds into the trust designated bank account, we called upon to do so by the duly authorized agent of the trust. They, they, they don't point to any paragraph or any portion of the judgment. Milady did not find that they were had to that they were obliged to breach their contractual obligations. We don't f- suggest that they were obliged that they were not obliged to pay over the money. They were contractually bound to pay the money. What they were bound to do was to report. That's what they did not do. The same thing appears in 5.2. Milady urged they say, finding that the defendant acted wrongfully in paying into the trust designated bank account the money. Same theme. Paragraph 7. In that regard, the court erred in apparently not considering the burden that the judgment places on every financial institution not to repay funds under its control. Milady, it goes on. Paragraph 8, the same thing. Paragraph 11. The court, moreover, erred in finding that the defendant had been negligent notwithstanding the evidence of the particular care it took to ensure that the instruction to liquidate the investment and repay the funds was a valid one. Paragraph 15.1, the approximate cause of the loss was the theft by the Prefidentia wrongdoers. No, the approximate cause was the failure to report. Again, paragraph 18, it's the same, it's the same thing, it's the same theme right throughout. So the reliance that they place upon the, uh, to get leave to appeal is based on findings Milady did not make. Then they introduce this concept of the novus actus. Um, they seem to place a, a lot of evidence on the novus actus, and we've dealt with that in our in, in our submissions. Um, we deal with that at paragraph nine, and we've referred to, um, or to authority that the novus is an independent event, and we say that there was no novus. It was. If you look at paragraph ten, we say. Lord Wright in Oropesa said, to break the chain of causation, it must be shown that there is something which I would call ultraneous, something unwarrantable, a new cause which disturbs the sequence of events, something which can be described as either unreasonable or extraneous or extrinsic. And we said there was nothing, it was all part of the same chain and cause, uh, um, um, same chain of events. It was, uh, the, the, there was no new cause which disturbed, which disturbed that chain. Um, I'm sorry, bear with me, Ben. Yes, in in paragraph 11, um, we say that the plaintiff's case and the court's finding was that the defendant's omission to make the reports allowed the financial wrongdoers to deal with the funds as they did. The theft of the funds was not an independent event. Rather, as was found by the court, it was an event that was or should have been foreseen. It was not a new cause which disturbed the sequence of, of events. Um, and the lady, they then referred to the fact that they say, well, this is a convoluted chain of events, but it's not convoluted at all. We, 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 we know from the judgment of Lee that what, what the court only has to ask, was there a probable chain or causation between the negligent omission in failing to report the loss. The, the, the but-for test is not the, the test that's applied anymore. It's the test that was applied in Lee, and that is the test that Milady applied after listening to Mr. Anderson. And we, we, we've set out that the court will assume that uh, um, administrators will carry out their functions, and there's no evidence, no evidence from them at all. Then they say, well, there would have been an urgent application. There was no evidence there'd be an urgent application. And, milady, they say that you imposed on them the duties of a trustee. That is not so. You, you did impose duty to a trustee. You didn't regard them as a trustee. They're not a trustee. We know, we know they're not a trustee, but Section 9 um, of Cisco imposes on them the duties of a, of, 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 a, of a trustee. And there's no, they then complain that milady has extended liability for pure economic loss. And they say how this would affect 
the, the public at large. This case is fact specific. It is fact specific. We're not going to have a situation where institutions are now going to be faced with the same facts where they will pay out and they will be at risk. In any event, the legislation has been tightened up. So you, you have not, you found, you do not need to extend the common law. With, with, you relied on the cases of, of pure economic loss. You, you found the, that there was foreseeability. You found the causation. You found the negligence. Um, and the lady, um, their, their whole ground is based on uh, the fact that, uh, that uh, you, you made findings. You did not make it. And this is the point. I've already said what the point is that, uh, uh, that they miss. Um, the lady, insofar as the um, uh, Mr. Bam says, there's always the possibility when you exercise a judicial discretion that another court may come. His words may come to another conclusion. No, that's not that's not the basis of relief to appeal. And in fact, when you exercise the discretion, it's more difficult to appeal for the court to overturn that discretion. So it's, 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 it's no basis if you apply the test scrupulously, as, as said by, by, by Leach and, and J.A., then that, 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 that does not pass master. The fact that they had a phase license doesn't help them at all. We've dealt with that in paragraph 24 of our, our submissions because We say that the complaint regarding the license to FAM is misplaced. No reliance was placed, and the court did not draw conclusions from the date of the licensing. As the, as the court specifically remarked in paragraph 147 of the judgment, irrespective of the issue of the license, FAM and Fidentia were unknown in the investment market. And the lady dealing with apportionment. There is no basis to just throw all this into, into your lap and say, you must work out what the apportionment is. Their problem is that there are other wrongdoers, and those wrongdoers were not joined. So how, well, what does one do with those other wrongdoers? What, what percentage must you um, apportion? It is impossible, and they, they place no evidence before you as to how um, you, should, you should make uh, the apportionment. They joined... They joined the, the company because they knew that that is where the, uh, if any, if they've got a claim, that's where it lay. They did not join the plaintiff, but let's assume they say because they're a party, you don't have to join a plaintiff. That may be so, but how can they seek an apportionment against the plaintiff? If I may give you this example, my lady, take the position of an executor. An executor steals money from the estate. That executor then gets removed. A new executor comes in. The new executor, in their version, now gets sued and must take the loss out of the estate to repay for that loss. That's exactly what they're saying should be done here. The money wasn't stolen by the trustee in the capacity as trustee. It was stolen by the company, which is a different capacity. So, my lady, if you are inclined to give leave to, to, to appeal, then... Uh, my lady should uh, not give leave in respect of their portion. There's absolutely no prospect of succeeding on the uh, issue of, of apportionment. Um, my lady, if you do grant leave to appeal, then we agree it should be to the Supreme Court of Appeal. My lady, we've put in our submissions. My lady's read them and... Um, we ask you not to go leave to appeal and to dismiss that. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the last time you dared me and you said, I shouldn't be frightened. <laughs> well, no, but this time, may, may I say, my lady, this time you should be uh, just apply the test scrupulously. <laughs> I will apply this test scrupulously, but for something in, in me, having looked at it, having listened to it, I think you will agree that the matter is important and it has implication for the industry at large. I accept that that's not what they say specifically in the notice of leave to appeal, but you will agree that that is the case. So. 
if, if I'm to, to answer that, milady, when when you excuse us, we're not going to leave shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Epstein. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pump? I'm going to be fairly uh, brief. My, my little friend tried to give a dictionary meaning to the word milieu in the context of what I said. Well, I just picked out the word from your ladyship's judgment, and I used it in the same way that your ladyship did use it. My little friend, the central point he makes, he ignores most of the issues we raised. There are two central points he makes. The one is to point to what we say about your findings. Well. We deal with two things, what you did find, but what you didn't find and what you ought to have found. Now, in relation to what you did find, you did make the finding that it was the living hands and those controlling who were responsible for the theft. What he says to you, though, is focus on what their case is, and that was the omission in reporting. But of course, we know that that's what they would like to focus on, that particular fact. But of course, when one comes to a finding on the duty of care, on causation, and on delictual liability, you look at all the facts before you. And what we say in relation to the central point that we were bound to report, and I've addressed you on that previously. First of all, what were the circumstances which uh, uh, so bound, Omut? Secondly, you can't ignore the fact that you had the evidence of Edgerson, you had the evidence of De Jong, uh, and the like, and none of them had the, uh, the suspicion. The third thing is what he ignores is assuming you had uh, there was reported. What, what were the facts that were before you? We, we're not talking about anything other than what was before you. Firstly, that they were licensed. Secondly, that uh, they were authorized. Now, on what basis uh, would there have been such an obligation? Now, let me then go back to the test. And can I just say this, my lady? Uh, we don't ask you to grant leave to appeal on the basis of fear or anything else. We ask you to do so on the basis of the test. And we accept the test. It's would, but so, so the two legs to it. Would come to a different conclusion or there are other compelling reasons. In relation to would come to a different conclusion, I illustrated to your leadership in my argument in chief that at every level of the finding, including at the, the dual contractual relationship, uh, there's a reasonable uh, 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 Another court could come to a different finding. I also illustrated to your leadership, and this is not dealt with by them at all, that the security uh, by, uh, in conduct that the beneficiaries had secured from the trustees, namely the standard, which would have been theft, willful misconduct, or gross negligence, was a standard they secured for themselves. Your leadership gave them better protection in the context of delict than they secured for themselves through the trustees. Now, all of that is simply ignored. And then we say this is a particular case in which, in relation to the facts, on the first leg of the test, uh, another, uh, that is met, and in relation to compelling circumstances, uh, it's not just the, we're not talking about the amount. We're talking about the contractual setting, we're talking about the obligation based on uh, fund uh, managers, and we're talking about the fact that your ladyship found that you can't say anything that flows directly from the uh, uh, legislation, but you can pick up something indirectly. And in relation to all of those, uh, another court uh, may look at it differently. But then, then what you don't about is the, 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 the let, let, let me address it. There are two things to that. Firstly, you'll find that whenever you go to the SA, the, the SA deals with the entire matter on the record before it. The second is this, your central finding in relation to the apportionment was that we didn't cite the first plaintiff. And, and that's, that's quite an important finding, because now what you've done is you've, you've made the finding that a party against whom we claim an apportionment, who was a party to the litigation, must nonetheless be found, uh, cited as a third party. We say that in law, uh, that's incorrect, and uh, another court may come to a different conclusion. The, 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 the second point is my learned friend says, in what proportion? Well. On the evidence before you, and I've already said it. I asked the same question. I asked no. the same question. No, no. And, and, and what I've said to you, on the evidence before you, assuming there was the omission, we, we say that, that, that another court could look at differently. Assuming there was the actionable omission, had the theft not taken place, 
the money would still have been there. That's the important thing. Had the theft not taken place by the very party entrusted to look after the money by way of a trustee. And in fact, then the beneficiaries would have had a claim because they had acted dishonestly and that falls within the provision of the trustees. Just tell me, how does that answer the question of in what proportion should we uh, have ordered an apportionment? We say entirely. We say entirely. Because 100%. 100% because that uh, not a cent would have been lost. Not a cent would have been lost. Thank you, Mr. Fung. Thank you. Can I... Um, I would have loved to give an order today, um, Mr. Epstein. And Mr. Fung, I would have loved to give an order today, but it would be remiss of me not to take one or two days to consider your submissions. And, um, and so I'm going to reserve judgment on appeal, but I undertake to give you a judgment by Monday. So yes, I, I just need time to digest what has been said to me. Um, so you. judgment on leave to appeal is reserved and parties will be notified of the outcome on Monday. As good news. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, my lady. you. Thank you to both of you. Thank you, my lady. Dear James.